The National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture, presents U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having farmers receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. The National Farmers Organization, pioneer of collective bargaining, the marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century. U.S. Farm Report now presents a visit with new NFO members with reporter Phil Allen. During this half hour, you're going to see a collection of these conversations uh, with members of the NFO who had joined, oh, I would say, within the past six weeks to two months. I was able to get these conversations in the states of Missouri, Illinois, and Iowa, as I did my regular circuit doing farm news commentaries. I'd like to say just a word. Uh, well, you'll see the farmers themselves, who are new members of the NFO, but let's take a moment to notice the conditions of agriculture as they were talking to me in these various videotape recordings. It was after a year in agriculture when the price of corn had dropped as much as 30 cents, more in some areas. It was after the price of livestock had diminished by about a third in the disastrous months of 1966 and 1967. It was a time when farmers knew that they had been urged by the government to tool up to produce more, and for reasons that uh, the whole American community had stated to them, not only domestic requirements, but on a world scale, and farmers in completely good faith had done so, and they had been told that with world demand as it was, there was every reason to expect the price to stay up, but it didn't. Uh, farmers begin to notice that when other basic industries are asked to tool up for the nation's needs, that there is a kind of an assurance uh, given, for example, to the steel industry or the automobile industry, that uh, the increased production will be done so that the producer can cover his costs and make a reasonable profit. But the farmers saw their prices uh, plummeting. They saw that no precautions had been made to protect the farmer, and there was a kind of a sense of betrayal. This is widespread among farmers. They also knew that the president had appointed a commission on food and fiber, which was actually talking about monkeying further with the parity idea, and talking about uh, farm operating credit in such a way that uh, the farmer who had um, long been able to demonstrate his ability to pay back, uh, might uh, be replaced in the standards for operating farm credit with one who might have a good potential as a professional manager of corporation farms. All these things are beginning to penetrate the conscience, uh, consciousness not only of farmers, but people in the rural areas as well. Uh, these farmers I was able to talk to are in the vastly productive corn livestock belt, where corn is produced in great quantity and soybeans and excellent livestock. I just thought I would pass this along to you as a background of the conditions against which these interviews were taken. I didn't make any particular effort to get any one sort of reason or reaction from any farmer, but I did notice there's a kind of a uniformity in their returning to the idea of efficiency. You'll probably notice this as you watch the interviews, too. And now let's turn to these conversations. Uh, let's see. First is Mr. Bill Bunning, who's sitting immediately to my right, and Jim Bradbury. They're both of Mawequa, Illinois. Right, gentlemen? Right. Supposing I start with Mr. Bunning. Why did you join the NFO? Well, I've only been farming on my own for about the past two years, but I lived on the farm all my life with my father. And uh, I've seen not only on, on our farm at home, but other farmers too. We've we've increasingly added more fertilizer, and uh, uh, more uh, put on more herbicides and insecticides, and, and uh, to increase our yield and to increase production. But uh, as far as just sitting down and really working for a price, to get a price for our, our commodities that we raise, we haven't done. And uh, I've I've found this in the NFO, and that's just why I joined. You've sort of been through the same route that farmers have with all of the 
urging that they've given each other and from outside agriculture and every place, be efficient, and you've done all that. That's right. I think that this is borne out by the steady stream of people all over the world who come to visit American agriculture, and they, uh, it's the envy of the world from the standpoint of technical efficiency. So you finally come to the conclusion that working with your neighbors for a price is the... Uh, That's absolutely right. We've got to work for a price. Well, uh, congratulations to you, Mr. Bunning. Let me talk now to Mr. Bradbury, Jim Bradbury, also of Mawequa. Why did you join the NFO? Well, I decided that we can't get anything through legislation. We can't do anything as individuals. So it, that only leaves one alternative to farmers to join together and work for themselves. And I think the NFO is the answer to that. I've uh, noticed in the years that I've done these radio and TV programs for NFO that one of the most appealing things to the public in general is that these are farmers who say we're going to try and solve it ourselves. And yeah. there's a certain amount of self-respect in that, I think. Well, I think it's, it just can't be done in that way. Mm -hmm. I have also belonged to one of the biggest farm organizations for 18 years, and they haven't helped us. They've sold me insurance and grain, but as far as getting a price and raising my standards of living, I don't, they haven't. I'm very interested to hear you say that, uh, Mr. Bradbury, because uh, I've heard uh, Orrin Lee Staley testifying before House committees in various discussions of the farm question, and his point of view is that a farm organization has no business trying to make a lot of money for itself, you know. Its job is to represent farmers. Well, I think he's absolutely right. I, this organization, it's, it is a big business in itself, and mm -hmm. they aren't trying to help the individual farmer. Well, you're speaking now of this organization that you, you were a member of for 18 I, years. For 18 years. The NFO started right out in the beginning, uh, as best I understand it, saying that the one function is to serve farmers, you know? Well, that's right, and I, I think all the money, all the salaries and everything that's paid by the NFO members, that is their only source of income, as I understand it. Yes. I work for them, and I know that's true. The only money the NFO has comes out of farmer's dues. So the only interest we represent is the farmer. And I also understand that you have to be a farmer to belong to the NFO. That's right. And so, in other words, it is controlled and run by the farmers. Thank you very much, and congratulations to you. Since Mr. Bradbury, in the conversation you just watched, made reference to another farm organization which he said he'd belonged to for 18 years. I want to state a point about the NFO's relationship to the rest of the groups, commodity associations, and farm organizations. NFO takes this position, that a farmer needn't be uh, against another organization he belongs to when he joins the National Farmers Organization. In fact, uh, we have said many times, uh, join them all if you can you know, if you can afford to pay dues to all the farm organizations and groups. The NFO has one purpose, which we don't think is in conflict with any other group, and that is to bargain for a better price for farm commodities. The next conversation you'll watch is one with Mr. Hal Bullen, who is also an Illinois farmer. Our uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Orville Freeman, advocates that farmers have collective bargaining. Yes, I noticed in his... Uh shirt sleeve tour, he, he seemed to be convinced that that's the approach that even the agriculture secretary should try to encourage. This seems plausible to you, huh? That's right. The NFO organization was the only group that's working for collective bargaining, and that's why I joined. Well, we're still in the state of Illinois, where they have, incidentally, some of the most expensive farmland that lies anywhere outdoors. Let's go to an interview I was able to record with the Block Brothers, uh, Gerald and Harry, who live near Oriana, which is in the central part of that state. Hey, why did you join the NFO? Well, it was a 40 cent drop in corn this year for the price of corn. Why? We figured something had to be done. And uh, it doesn't seem as though uh, cutting acres or anything will do it, so uh, I think collective bargaining will. You've been through all those experiences of other approaches yeah. to. Uh, trying to manage supply, and I suppose you've been through all the debates with, uh, with the whole countryside about what kind of farm programs ought to come out of the government. And so Pretty on. much so, yes, sir. 
Uh, Harry, what, uh, how would you respond to that question? Why did you join the NFO? Well, I felt it was a necessity to join. Uh, uh, just like Jerry said, uh, prices are going down. Uh, operating costs and taxes and so forth keep getting higher. Uh, we have to realize a little profit for the operation that we uh, have. So I, I just felt it was a necessity to join. Uh, now, your farm, uh, 600 acres, uh, is it predominantly grain farming or also livestock? Uh, yeah, predominantly grain, but we do have quite a few hogs and uh, cattle, uh, I suppose diversified. I'd like to put this question to you both, uh, gentlemen. Um, Jerry, does it seem to you that a, a volume transaction where farmers work with each other in selling is a good idea? If handled in the right way, yes. I think the NFO could do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, this is one of the reasons that we joined. Does it seem to you that that's the approach to it, Harry? Uh, it's a logical uh, approach. Uh, I, I think there's strength in numbers, and if we can get our neighbors to join with us, uh, if we can get the ideas across to them the way we saw them, uh, I think we have a good thing going for us. Now, how long have you been members of the NFO? About three weeks. You've joined about the same time? Uh -huh. uh, we've been looking around for a long time uh, for some way, uh, some organization or other that uh, we could work with that might help us. And uh, the meeting of home there uh, the other night, uh, arguments the, uh, that the NFO had, I believe were the best we've heard in a long time. Let's cross the Mississippi River now into the state of Iowa where they sort of feel that they have some fine land too and they're in the heart of the corn livestock area. And let's talk to a farmer who lives at Jessup, Iowa, uh, one of the Hogan brothers. Uh, together they farm 900 acres in the state of Iowa. This is a conversation with Tom Hogan. I want to ask you this question. Why did you join the National Farmers Organization? We wanted a fair price for our commodity to realize our investment. And as a grain farmer, you felt that uh, joining with the National Farmers, how long have you been a member of the NFO? Since September. So this is an, a new member, relatively speaking. Now, let me ask you this, Tom. There were things about the National Farmers Organization I expect that you wanted to be completely satisfied in your own mind about. Well, what are some of the things that, that you were curious about the NFO before you joined? Well, we, one thing about like was the, the grain pool ahead. Yes. The in-position grain sales and so on. One, the freight on it was really the big thing, really. Yes, you wanted to be satisfied with all the details about that. Right. To, to make, you know, to, we weren't paying uh, more than the guy that was living right next to us. Earlier in this collection of visits with new members of the National Farmers Organization, we crossed from Illinois across the Mississippi River going westward into Iowa. Now supposing let's go westward some more across the Hawkeye State and a bit south to the banks of the Missouri River at St. Joseph, Missouri. I had a very fascinating conversation with two Missourians, one a cattle feeder and the other, oh, a grain farmer, but also in general farming. Uh, these two gentlemen had just recently joined. One was Horace Powell, who lives at Edgerton, Missouri. And then after you hear my conversation with him, I will talk with Mr. Owen Boydston of near Dearborn, Missouri. Now here's the talk with Mr. Powell. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do in chatting with Mr. Boydston, who lives in Dearborn, Missouri, and Mr. Powell from Edgerton, is just ask the simple question, why did you join the NFO? So why don't we begin? I'll turn to Mr. Powell first. Why did you join the NFO? Well, for 20 years, we've been beat over the head with this thing of efficiency. And I think the farmer is about efficient as he can get. I'm running 435 acres by myself. I have 90 head of cows and 60 head of ewes, and I feed out all my calves, which incidentally I sold on grade and yield. And uh, I'm about as efficient as I can get, and I think we'd better try to get some of this efficiency into our marketing system, Phil. Very good point. You mentioned grade and yield transactions. Couldn't, uh, I, I know a lot of farmers are interested in marketing in that fashion. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we were visiting 
just before we came on the camera here, you mentioned that you had traded with Graydon Yield uh, uh, even before you joined the NFO, hadn't you? Uh, I thought about it, but I joined the NFO to go Graydon Yield, really. I see. In hopes of getting a better price for the product, my, my calves are creek fed on the cows, and then they go into a dry lot, and uh, those calves that are born in this spring won't be sold till next uh, August or September. And uh, much to my amazement, my heifers out yielded my steers in grade, and my steers yielded 62, and my heifers yielded 62.4. And I thought that was a very good yield. Now, I never had a choice steer in my life, or a prime steer, I might say, when I would go to the yards. But uh, when I went grade and yield, I found I had a good percent of my cattle were prime cattle. And I'll just and footnote for this audience, you were uh, in these grade and yield transactions with the plant here in the St. Joseph area that the NFO was furnishing. Yes, right? I was. And uh, I got a bid on my cattle out of the yards, the best bid I could get. And I didn't go to the yard, so I went grade and yield. And my cattle figured out a good dollar a hundred above what I could have uh, gotten in the yards if they could have got what they bid me. I see. And so I was very well pleased with it. Just another note here on this efficiency thing. Uh, have you ever had the experience of noticing that uh, maybe some farmer isn't quite as efficient as people say he ought to be in production and yet is making more money? Yes, it's, he seems to be, uh, this efficiency thing uh, is questionable. We, we uh, try real hard. Uh, this year, for the first time in my life, I have a 100% cat crop. And that's on 90 head of cows. So that's, that's about as efficient as you can get. I should say Phil. so. But uh, uh, when I bring those 90 head of cattle in next year, I may take home the same check as I would have if I'd had 85 head. So uh, does it pay to be efficient? as efficient as we are. That's, uh, that's questionable. I've noticed one thing, that uh, American agriculture is the envy of the world. There's a steady stream of people from all over the world visiting our agriculture. It's that efficient in production. And yet, uh, I've heard some farmers say that we're way back in the 19th century in terms of inefficient marketing. We are. Uh, <coughs> there's no question about it. And if there isn't some change, I mean, I think that the people are joining the NFO as in desperation, really. The yes, I, the I see your point there. Uh, the, the farmer is desperate, and he joined the NFO in desperation. Uh, describe just for a minute, uh, if you will, the conditions of the cattle industry. Now, you had many years' experience in it, Mr. Powell. Uh, what is the condition of the cattle industry now? Oh, I don't see how cattle is holding up as well as they are with hogs as cheap as they are. Mm -hmm. I used to produce around 1,000 head of hogs a year, but I had to quit because... Uh, I couldn't get the labor to do it. And That's a real problem for a farmer nowadays, isn't it? Uh, well, yes, I, there's 200 people that goes out of our town every morning to draw anywhere from 275 to $5 an hour, and uh, I can pay one $2 an hour. Let's be frank, I can't pay one $1 an hour. Mm -hmm. You're farming pretty much alone and, and a cattle feeder. That's what I'm trying to do. You yes. mentioned that uh, the I'm, rest of today, after this broadcast, you're going to work alone in some operation. What's that? I haven't. Oh, I'm going to chop silage by myself because I can't get any help. I haven't had a vacation in three years. That's, that's the situation that farmers face now. I wish more of the public understood this. Uh, in a, an operation where the cost price squeeze is on every farmer, uh, including expensive operations like cattle, and uh, there's a difficulty in getting help. So you joined the NFO a couple, three weeks ago. Oh, about two months ago. I see. But uh, I, I joined the NFO to bring my cattle on grade and yield. It's the first time I've ever fed, I fed a lot of cattle, but it's the first time I ever seen them hanging on the hook, on the rail after I had fed them. And this in itself is an education. Yes. It is, to see your cattle after you have fed them. Well, that experience coming out of the NFO in, in, in just an educative sense is, 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 worth well worth, is well worth the membership if they hadn't brought a dime more. Very good. Uh, just as a human interest point here, Mr. Powell, I notice you have a sticker here on your coat that says, I'm committed. What does oh, that mean? I'm committed to attend Sunday school every Sunday for four Sundays. Now, that's a laugh. I don't think I've missed over two Sundays in the <laughs> last 20 years. But uh, it's kind of a gimmick to try to get people to come to our church. Very good. Very good. I'm going to turn to Mr. Boydston, who lives at Dearborn, Missouri, 
And uh, Mr. Boydson, you farm about 250 acres in grain, isn't that mostly grain? Yes, some livestock, hogs, a few cows. Well, why did you join the NFO? Mainly to try to get a better price for what we, what we pr produce. And, uh, and all we ask is a fair profit for what we produce, and I think we can obtain this through uh, collective bargaining. Very good and idea. Buy and sell in a group. Uh, I don't think an individual can do it on their own. They've been trying that for now, for years. And I they, suppose in the, in the years that have gone by, uh, you have sensed all the, the things that people have said about efficiency, as Mr. Powell mentioned. Yes. And yet, uh, supposing you have your grain crop come in and you hold at harvest time, which is good uh, practice, then if you go in all alone, where are you? Yeah, that's right. And if it costs a dollar, say, to produce a bushel of corn and you sell it for a dollar or maybe less, uh, how can you pay off debts that way? You can't uh, work with no profit. I'd like to hear uh, you and Mr. Powell uh, maybe discuss this point, because I know there have been lots of proposals, you know, gentlemen, about what farmers ought to do, and we've had many years when farmers have debated the idea of uh, a better bill coming out of Congress, for instance. Now, in your field, in grain farming, I imagine there's been a lot of, uh, a, a lot of urging from outside agriculture that you take a certain attitude or not take a certain attitude about about what level grain ought to be pegged at. Would you would you talk about that a, a minute or so? Well, I'd rather uh, hear you talk a little bit. <laughs> from work, but uh, but I know that you can't uh, you can't go out here and and uh, raise this and sell it for cost. Uh, all we ask is a fair profit for what the wealth fund we produce, and I don't think that's out of the question at all. I think everyone should have a, a profit. Why work for nothing? And you can't work for nothing. You're expressing right there, Mr. Boydston, an attitude that everybody in this audience has. And it seems appalling to me that they don't recognize that a farmer ought to have the same attitude. I've never heard anybody in any business that won't say exactly what you just said. Uh, a fair and reasonable profit and cover your costs is a legitimate goal for any business, isn't it? Right. And the way we're losing farmers uh, all over the country, it won't be long until uh, there might not be anything to eat, and we've got to eat, you know. Mm -hmm. I got that from some of the things Mr. Powell was saying. Yes. With this kind of pressure on agriculture, uh, what were you saying, Mr. Powell? Uh, didn't you have a conversation with a banker, and it wasn't... Uh, Tell us about yes, that. Yes, uh, I, I, I imagine that out around Edgerton there used to be at least 50 cattle feeders, and he informed me the other day that I was the only cattle feeder left operating out of the bank of Edgerton. Now, mm -hmm. uh, that was amazing to me. And uh, I, another thing I'd like to add, uh, Owen raises corn, and I buy. I don't raise any corn. I buy all my feed. Good point. And uh, it looks like in business sense, that I would make money by buying cheap feed. You can't do that. Uh, you never made a dime feeding cheap corn because next year everybody will produce hogs and cattle and the market will go down and your cattle will go mm -hmm. down. And I, I can make more money feeding a dollar and a half corn any time than I can a dollar corn. Mm -hmm. In other words, what he's suggesting there is that uh, as the price of corn goes, so goes livestock. That's mm -hmm. right. I believe that. Uh, what about the proposal? Uh, let me throw this out. I'll be the devil's advocate here. Now, supposing I would urge you gentlemen, uh, uh, well, why don't you just get the government to peg the prices of these farm commodities the way they ought to be and uh, urge all the farmers to get in uh, together and vote in such a way as to elect people who would do that? What would your response be to that? Well, supposing I would urge you to be a political being now and try and get somebody to go to Washington and do it. I, uh, I, I don't think I'm qualified to make too much of a comment on that right at this time. Uh, maybe Horst would like to... We've tried it for that. 30 years. We've yeah. tried that for 30 <laughs> years and where we got uh, no place, really. Uh, we've got to get farming out of politics, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. We've got to get farming out of politics. Yes, this is the, uh, this is the major premise of the Because NFL. with about 6% of the vote, we, we don't stand a chance. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, politicians are going to cater to the consumer, and so uh, we've got to, we've got to get out of politics, get thrown out of politics. We no longer control the vote. It seems to me that there wouldn't be the NFO now if there weren't farmers who have sensed this. As it's now down to a six point something, isn't it, the percentage yes. that farmers are? Yes. And the consumers are all the rest, and farmers themselves are consumers, of course, but it seems to me the politicians are beginning to sense, well, if I'm going to court where the votes are, I'd better please the guys who buy the food, not the guys who raise the food. So, uh, and yet, you who produce the food still have the power that any producer has, isn't that right? Well, I certainly enjoyed talking with you. Uh, just a kind of a little side bet that uh, Mr. Powell and I had. Uh, he was he was uh, feeling that maybe this would be a pretty long quarter hour because it was his first time <laughs> on television. The quarter hour is gone now. We ha they're already signaling us. We had one minute and we're down and now down to thirty seconds. Maybe we better come and back again. Yes, <laughs> love to have you come back again. I've been talking with Mr. Owen Boydston of Durban, Missouri, and Horace Powell of Edgerton, Missouri. I really wish we had longer than a half an hour to cover these conversations we've had with new members, but uh, don't you feel, as I do, in watching these various interviews, that here are farmers who understand the trends in agriculture. Uh, two things come to my mind. One is a comment made by an editorial writer in one of the rural newspapers. I've forgotten now just whether it was a weekly paper or one that's published twice a week. At any rate, he was talking about the National Farmers Organization, and he said, it appears to be an organization whose time has come. He was taking note of all of the uh, growing awareness of farmers that they're going to have to solve the problem themselves and not count on the government or someone outside agriculture. Another thing that came to my mind was a comment I heard one time at a big farm meeting. Who are these people in the NFO, big farmers or little? Well, that's not the point. These are the farmers who know what's happening to agriculture. It's something to think about. <laughs> You have heard another program in the series, U.S. Farm Reports, sponsored by the National Farmers Organization. Leading this generation in agriculture, the NFO was built to bring farm marketing into the 20th century. Why not visit with the leaders of the NFO in your county or write to the headquarters in Corning, Iowa? And for another in this series, U.S. Farm Reports, tune in this same station next week at this hour. Thank you.